Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayek Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say with hearts of thanksgiving, hallelujah. Well, friends, today is November the 22nd in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, I trust that you are feeling thankful in Jesus for the many blessings that he has bestowed upon you. And before we jump into our text, I was reading the book of Ephesians yesterday, and I want to read something to you that spoke to me very deeply. Chapter 1, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All spiritual blessings, friends, are yours for the taking if you will only surrender to his will. Reach out and receive all that he has in store for you. According as he has chosen you in him before the foundation of the world, you were on his mind before he ever created the earth. Why? That you should live holy and without blame before him in love. Hallelujah. What a precious set of promises that he has offered unto us. If we will only in faith ask for them and then receive them as gifts from a father, from a loving father unto his son. May that be where your efforts lie this day, friends. Well, we're continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, and today we are in chapter 7, which for many is a very mysterious chapter. So in order to understand this, we're going to go back a little bit. But let's read uh, Hebrews chapter 7, and let's begin at verse 1. It says, for this Melchizedek, who is this? There's very little mention of him in the Bible, but he must be very important because the writer of Hebrews is pointing him out to us. He says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness. And after that also he was called king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now, do you remember in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, or the King of Peace. And in our text, it tells us Melchizedek, whom is also called in verse 2, king of peace. Now let's pause right there and let's understand what's being said because he says, this Melchizedek in verse one, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. Now this was a bloody battle indeed, friends, that went on for decades. But let's go back to Genesis and let's look at chapter 14 and let's begin at verse one. It came to pass in the days of Amphrophel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eleazar, Chelomar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. So we have four kings listed so far. Now these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. Now all of these kings were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the salt sea. Twelve years they serve Chador Laamor, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Chedlor Amor and the kings that were with him. And they smote the Rephraims in Ashtoreth Kernium, and Zumans in Ham, and the Emans in Shava Kiriathim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And after this great smiting, they returned and came to Emishpat which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazan Tamor. 
Now, this is a fierce battle that is taking place, and people are being smitten everywhere. The bloodshed is great. And it says in verse 8, there went out of the king of Sodom, the king of Morah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bala, the same as Zor, and they joined battle with them in the valley of Siddim, with Chedor Laamor, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariat, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. And the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountains. So the battle is coming to an end. Now they went in and they plundered the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They took all their food, which is their victuals, and they went on their way. But while they were in Sodom and Gomorrah, they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that escaped and told Abraham the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, or actually his nephew, Lot, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night smote them and pursued them unto Hobah which is on the left hand of Damascus. So as mighty as these men might have been, they were no match for Abram and his warriors. And so after Abram defeats him, he brings back all the goods and he brings back his nephew Lot and his goods and the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Cheler de Lamar and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be thee, Most High God, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Now this is the story of Melchizedek visiting Abram given to us in the early writings of Moses in the book of Genesis. Now back to our text, in verse 1, that's what he's reminding us of. Melchizedek, king of Salem, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And because of his blessing, Abraham, formerly known as Abram, gave a tenth part of all that he had. And he gave it to Melchizedek, whom also is called king of righteousness, king of Salem, king of peace. He who is without father and without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Now there is much speculation as to whom this is. And from an initial reading, specifically without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, this simply could mean that there is no record of him. There's no record of where he came from, no record of where he died, no record of his father, no record of his mother. But it could also be that this is speaking of the Lord Jesus before he took human form and he presented himself to Abram as the king of Salem, the king of righteousness, in a man who was called Melchizedek. I'll leave you to your own studies and your own conclusions, for it's really not important. It has nothing to do with our day-to-day -day journey. It's only something that intellectually we may be challenged to better understand. And so we're going to pass by that. But in verse 4, it says, Consider how great this man was, Melchizedek unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of his spoils. So he was beyond human flesh. There was something very special about him. He says in verse 5, Verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that was later given to Moses, that didn't exist during the time of Abram. But we can go back to the times of Adam and Eve and even see that with Cain and Abel, there was always a desire in the heart of man to give back to God as a token of what he has so gratefully given to us. And that is where the tithe comes from. And so the Levites, who would later take on this office, they have come from the loins of Abraham. And yet they, the Levites, and the priesthood which followed were only a shadow 
of things to come. They were a shadow of the Lord Jesus and the new covenant that he will bring. That's what we see in verse 12. The priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. In verse 18, there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And so the writer of the book of Hebrews understands that he is writing unto a people that hold the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, to them the writings of Moses and the prophets, they hold them as very sacred. And so he's trying to point out that there was a purpose for the first covenant, But Jesus has brought about a new day, a new priesthood, a new temple, a new covenant. That's why he says in verse 15, it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. In verse 22, Jesus has been made a surety of a better testament. Because in verse 24, he continueth ever and hath an unchangeable priesthood. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever lives to make intercession for them. Not just once a year like the high priest did, but every moment of every day, Jesus is interceding on yours and my behalf. In verse 26, he as a high priest became us, and he is holy, he is divine in character, he is harmless, he is innocent and simple, he is undefiled, he is pure and unspotted, he is separate from sinners, and he has been made higher than the heavens. And so he does not need daily, as those former high priests, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. And that's why it says in chapter 8, verse 6, now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And these promises consist of the fact that we no longer go to a high priest once a year to confess our sins, or even on a daily ritualistic basis to confess our sins, but we can go into the very holy of holies, the very throne room of God, with a surrendered heart and a bowed knee, and make our petitions known unto him, and know that he as a loving father, as our great high priest, as the king of our souls, hears us and loves us, and according to his will, will meet our needs. And if we only knew what the Jewish people had to go through on a daily basis, our hearts would sing hallelujah for such liberty and freedom that we have in the Spirit before the Father through his Son, Jesus. Hallelujah, friends. Well, I trust that your journey will be filled with joy today that you will walk in the fullness of his spirit with a spring in your step and a song upon your heart. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.